So thank you, Martin. I really appreciate it. One, the idea was uh, with Martin covering that material is it gives you another viewpoint of the rate of transfer. You get a different person speaking, and he comes at it from a true imaging spectroscopy viewpoint. And the idea of doing the atmosphere correction gives you all of the concepts that we have to have in order to understand rating to transfer in doing the reflectance-based methodology. And so now what I'm going to try and do is tie some of the concepts that Martin brought up and apply them more directly to instead of going from the top or where we have the aircraft sensor, the satellite sensor is down to the bottom, we're going to be going from the bottom up to the top. So this is one way that we get someone else besides hearing the same voice all day long from the same person, you get to hear a different person with a different viewpoint and a different concept. So I always try to make sure that I, I cover the material in a way that fits myself as well as to try and tie to what Mark was talking about. And this is the one kind of view graph. This is basically the um, radiance out the top of the atmosphere. And the top curve is the total radiance out of the top of the atmosphere. And this is done using a rate to transfer code. Um, I would probably say that it's the code I wrote myself many, 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 many years ago. The photons haven't changed that much over time, so it still works okay. Um, and it's always it's just easier for me to do it myself because it's one that I do very well. And you can reproduce this with ModTran or you can use Success or any other methods we talked about yesterday or that Martin briefly mentioned as he was talking about how the ATCOR model is based on some of these other codes. In order to have this top of atmosphere prediction, we have to know all of the inputs. So everything that Martin was talking about in terms of the aerosol optical depths, the molecular optical depths, the wavelength, uh, the surface reflectance, the view angle, the geometry of the sun, all of that goes into the code. So basically when you see the sun, the view angle is 60 degrees. So instead of looking straight down, it's looking off to the side at 60 degrees. So the zenith angle is 45 degrees. And I do that again, as I mentioned yesterday. I will oftentimes just use 45 because it doesn't matter if you're going up 45 or horizontal to 45, it's the same. So even if there's a confusion in terminology, it goes away with a 45 degree sun. Uh, no absorption. So that means I have no water vapor or ozone causing any confusion in this particular problem. And if you recall yesterday, we talked about there were three basic parts to what we get at the top of the atmosphere. So you have the light from the sun coming directly through the atmosphere, and the mark again brought all these terms up. Transmitted using Beer's Law all the way down to the surface, reflected, and then goes back out the top through the atmosphere without, well, and it can be attenuated through the atmosphere there. The transmittance along the solar path to the ground, and then along the ground to the end of the sensor. And that's the blue dash line. Then there's the um, no, I'm sorry, this is the, the orange line is the reflected solar. This blue line, you should know that because it's blue, the sky is blue, this is our skylight. And this is the path radiance, this is just coming out of the last photon that reaches the sensor, came from something bouncing it towards the sensor in the atmosphere. It does not mean that it only hit things in the atmosphere. It still hit the ground and hit the atmosphere, it hit the ground, hit the atmosphere, and then the sensor. It just is the last bit of interaction is with the atmosphere someplace right before it gets to the sensor. And then the purple is all of the light coming down from the sky, hits the ground, and works its way back up through the atmosphere. And it can be attenuated, but this is basically its last interaction before it reaches my sensors with the ground. And all three of those now in terms of the optical thickness, this is the total optical thickness here, really it, it all amounts to, to the aerosol because we're picking a specific wavelength, the molecular optical depth will stay the same, and I'm just increasing the amount of dust and particulate matter in the atmosphere. So as you start to add material in the atmosphere, so as I start to increase the optical depth, what happens to the total radiance out the top of the atmosphere? Go up, go down, or stay the same. So 
I got one gopher up, I got one in the back, I got a few other kind of thumbs up. So this line is slightly sloped upward. So the radiance off the top of the atmosphere is increasing as we get an increase in optical thickness, as we introduce more material in the atmosphere. And what's nice about the radiative transfer is it allows us to break the pieces down theoretically. And the reason I bring this up in the sensitivity discussion of the uncertainties is it allows us to then figure out where we might have uncertainties in our characterization of the atmosphere. Because I can break this up. If I'm the sensor, I cannot do this. The only way I can do this is theoretically with a physics-based radiative transfer program. That's the fun of it. That's why I like, like the job I have. And it's also because I can start to visualize things. I like to work in the visible near and red perspective because, again, I can see what is happening. So let's start with the solar. Again, this is a photon coming from the sun. It gets through the atmosphere, bounces off the ground, and makes it back through the atmosphere. As we increase the optical thickness, what happens to the number of photons going from the sun to the ground directly to the sensor? Go up, go down, or stay the same. Now I'm starting to do some more voices. I saw a few more. It's nice the guys in the back, they're kind of using their hands and they're making hand signals. And it's, it's fun because you know, they, 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 they kind of do this. Or, <laughs> but they're, they're, you're not watching them. If they, they think they know the answer, it just it's sort of goes down. And that should make sense. If I'm at the ground, <coughs> Tell me this. I always have to I never look directly at the sun. It blinds you. It's not there. It doesn't. But if we could look at the sun and we start putting more stuff in the atmosphere, the sun will look dimmer. We get less energy from there. And likewise, the odds of me getting a photon off of the ground and through the atmosphere with nothing happening to it as the atmosphere gets thicker goes down. So I get a decrease in the total amount of energy. Now I have no absorption. So that means that the photons pretty much had to go someplace. Now, I do have, I have a bottom that serves sort of reflectance. That's why we have some absorptions. I don't have a, a new reflectance. My reflectance is 25. But sort of to compensate this, those photons that didn't reach the ground, a lot of them are getting bounced back up, up the top of the atmosphere. The ones that bounced around in the atmosphere and hit the ground, they are struggling. They, they really kind of get the bad end of the deal here because they can't make it back out because there's so much stuff between it and the sensor, from the ground and the sensor, but they get attenuated and so your, your reflected skylight pretty much stays the same, but this path radius turn increases dramatically. The amount of energy that the atmosphere is putting out towards the sensor is going up, while the amount of energy going directly from the sun to the sensor is going down. So that's a quick and dirty kind of explanation of radiative to transfer. We have these three components that as we start to add things into the atmosphere, we get interactions in terms of what's going to happen. And if I'm out of site where I have a very thick atmosphere, a 0.5 reflectance, I'm really going to have to make sure I understand what my aerosols are doing in a scattering sense because I really have a dominant source of uncertainty related to the scattering in the atmosphere. The attenuation part, actually I can measure that really well, but it doesn't make much of a difference anymore. I, I don't help myself with doing solar radiometry very well in this particular case down here at 0.6. But down at 0.1, which is more like what I have in Railroad Valley, I'm better off making sure I have a good measurement of atmospheric transmittance and an okay understanding of how light is scattering in the atmosphere. And that's how we start to understand where we need to put our emphasis, where we start to put our efforts in the measurement. And same thing in terms of now if we look at surface reflectance. So at zero reflectance, do you think we ought to, well, one, look at it, do you think you should have zero radiance? If you're at the top of the atmosphere with a satellite sensor and you're looking down at the surface and the surface is perfectly absorbing. Will you see any light? Yes. Yeah. You look at, and it's the same thing as the analog is if you're at the ground looking up. 
the reflectance of space is zero. But the sky is still blue because we're getting path rate in terms. We're getting scattered. And so the entire amount of energy is not zero, and it's all from path radiance, this blue line. Now what you notice is in this particular situation, once we have this setup with this 0.5 optical depth, I'm all the way out here, path radiance is already dominated by a lot. And so I can never get a reflectance that's large enough to where the path radiance gets taken over but I can start to see that at least I'm getting a little bit more of component from these reflected skylight and reflected direct solar, which makes sense. I have a brighter surface. The photons aren't getting sucked into the ground. They're getting bounced back off of the ground and up to the top of the atmosphere. This is only the tip of the type of things you can do with radio transfer to understand your uncertainty analysis, what you do as a sensitivity, or you do it as an uncertainty, and then you read that into a direct error budget discussion. What's nice is the reason I, I, I knew Mark would be talking a little bit about some airborne things. I know he was talking in that mostly, but you know, when you bring a new fly, you have to talk some kind of airborne. Mm -hmm. some level. We can look at the impact as a function of altitude. And we can start to say, if I were going to try to make measurements, and the reason we did this study was, if we were going to try and why are radiometers in an aircraft? How high would we need to go before we pretty much do not have to worry about doing any atmospheric radiation transfer? Everything's below us, that's important. The energy that we're measuring, we can treat that as the bottom of the atmosphere, and then it really is just exactly what we would measure going all the way to the top. Again, we're ignoring ozone and things that might be above us. But you start to look at how it happens as a function of wavelength, and you have a uh, uh, a low altitude line, mid altitude line, and a high altitude line. Um, and these are basically related to the three and a half, five and a half, and seven and a half kilometer elevation relative to arriving at a test site. So this is above that set. So 3,000 meters above that. And it's the percent difference from the full atmosphere. Um, a zero out <coughs> means that you basically get everything you want. And yes, it is weird. It goes above that zero percent. And it's just an odd feature in the way the atmosphere can scatter direction out and direction it. It's kind of a weird thing. Um, but once you get to high altitude, at the short wavelengths, you never can get as close to within 10 percent. But you think about that. 10 percent. So I, I'm basically doing my rate to transfer, and I have all the 10 percent of the photons accounted for. If I fly at seven and a half kilometers above my surface, I could make a hundred percent error in my rate of transfer calculations and only have a one percent uncertainty in my top of atmosphere calculations. Go ten percent. If ten percent. If I have a ten percent error in my calculations, with a ten percent, in fact, I get a one percent uncertainty. And that's the beauty of it, is now you start to be able to say, okay, if I do my count, if instead of doing reflected space measurements at the ground, I do my reflected space measurements from an aircraft, once I get to half of, once I get to half of 500 nanometers, I'm pretty much at, at 7.5 kilometers, I have the right answer already. I can just assume nothing. I have to make no measurements of the atmosphere at all, and I'm fine. Short of 500 nanometers, I just have to, put my thumb up with a little bit of moisture on it and say the wind's blowing from the north, uh, let's make the atmosphere this today. And then, why be good enough? And it's all because of this combination of theoretical study with the actual measurements. And for me, it's, it's a lot easier to do this than it is to try and figure out exactly how I'm going to combine three ASDs, a given test site, a hot summer day, possibly clouds, maybe rain, and try and tease out a half percent uncertainty due to an ASD malfunction. This I can do exactly. And then it's just whether or not the modeling I'm doing is representative of what is in reality happening. So a little bit more about the upline radius, but I'm going to do some more of this uh, sensitivity discussion. Uh, path radiance is the upline sky radiance. Complications of because of this reflective downwelling is interacting with the atmosphere. So you get all these multiple, and this is why we have to do all these fancy calculations. 
you can't just count one path of sun to atmosphere to ground to sensor. And you've got to be worried about, especially as the reflectance goes up and the atmospheric loading goes up, of multiple bounces happening back and forth. And so it's, it's a fairly complicated approach, and this is why the range of transfer codes are fairly complicated. And what's in this is the more the thicker the atmosphere, the brighter the surface, the more the heterogeneity of the surface plays a big role, and you start to get things with what Martin brought up in terms of adjacency effect. What happens nearby in terms of is that going to impact the results I have for my sensor? What I'm looking at is affected by the things around it that I do not actually see with my camera, with my image. So again, view angle now. Uh, so I showed you reflectance. I showed you optical thickness. The nadir angle, and this again, I'm glad I had this one in. It's just fortuitous because Martin had a similar plot, a similar problem. This, this nadir angle, as you start to look off axis, you're looking through larger atmosphere. That's the equivalent of just having an increase in optical thickness. You get some other interactions with how the, the aerosols, the dust, scattered in a directional sense. But for the most part, it's the same idea is that as we go to larger nadir angles, we have more optical thickness, and basically, depending on the surface reflectance, you can get a, a, a top of atmosphere radiance that will change. And it goes up in both cases, but it's more dramatic in the case of the zero reflectance. So zero reflectance, I still have a non-zero radiance, but as I look off nadir, I get an increase. So if I'm up at the top and I look straight down and I'm looking at water, it looks really kind of blue. As I start to look off to the edges, it doesn't look as blue because I'm getting more scattering. I'm getting more scattering spectrally as well. So then I start to fill in all of the other colors. The same thing happens if you look straight up. On a clear day, you'll see blue sky. And as you look down towards the horizon, you'll see whiter sky. And that's because you get more scattering of all of the coloring because of the longer path point through the atmosphere. And I showed that earlier. So now we have all the pieces to really understand this miser imagery where we look at later, and yesterday we were kind of sleepy and we were getting just the atmospheric extent discussion. Today, now, you're seeing it a second time. You've seen the presentation in terms of the range of transfer calculations. You can see why this blue looks the way it is. But more importantly is, in the case of Mark, he can use that information and retrieve information about the surface and the atmosphere to get at the optical thickness, to get at the surface reflectance, to get at the bidirectional reflectance. In our case, we're going to take this and say, we're going to make sure we don't do a lot of calibrations in one of these conditions. So if you were going to try to calibrate a sensor out at a test site, and you got to choose between trying to do a nadir view a 60 degree view, which one would make the most sense to try and do? Or more sense? Which one makes more sense? The nadir or the off nadir? Yeah. Nadir. Because the atmosphere is not playing as big of a role. It only took us a day and a half to get to where we could make this conclusion. And, and it was a long day and a half. I mean, it seems like I, I was sitting down, I was chatting with, with my wife about the training course. And I stopped and I realized that the equivalent number of hours that we're spending in here is about the same as seven weeks in a normal college class. If you give or take, you know, if it's, it's a 15 week course and three hours a week, 45 hours total, and we're doing what, 20 something hours in two days? So it's. You should get a, a, what, one and a half credits. <laughs> I don't think I should go even to leave for a while. But Leland could go <laughs> with ask. So it, it, it's a lot of material in a very short period of time. But you now are starting to get the tools to make good decisions and to understand what's happening. And I want to take this a little bit further and look at a, a, an off neighbor situation because this is, combines the nature transfer combines bidirectional reflectance, combines bad assumptions. So if you see that I, I'm more than happy to point out where I make the bad assumptions. Um, and it answers a question that Chris, I think it was, that was talking about. So the diffuse is important. What about the actual direction 
optical reflectors. Does that play a role? And I'm using one of my favorite sensors again. I apologize. There's not a lot of imaging spectroscopy. Do. It's a shame that Yamamoto san was, you won't see this example because he probably was at the site for some of these measurements. Um, three band visible near infrared combination for the Aster sensor. And you can see my three tarps marking out the test site that I can pop wire. Um, and the reason you can see it really well is for Aster band one, they show up very clearly. Uh, so especially if you look at the two right hand ones. You go to Aster band three major, so the reason there's a three N and a three B is one telescope looks straight down and the other one looks backwards at 23 and a half degrees. So the three N, there are no targets. I liked when I started working the 3B, the tarps show up again. <laughs> and it really, it, 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 they showed that. The, the, the tarps, they, they really do not have that strong of a bidirectionality, especially where they would be darker, where the reflectance would go down. It's almost as though there was a spectral component to where the skylight was being reflected away from the view. That's the only thing I can come up with, but it's very, it's, it even shows up better when you change the contrast. These tarps really show up. So you can have bidirectional objects that change as a function of wavelength. And so you go from Aster Band 1 to Aster Band 3, and the tarps really do not, and that's more of a spectrum, but there's also the same spectrum here. And the angular effect causes a change in the way the system behaves. And that got me thinking about. Maybe I want to try and play more with the band 3B and try and do a calibration. And more importantly, we just want to do a cross calibration. So we can use a lot of test sites and because the sensors are basically only a few minutes apart. We can do comparisons, especially if we can find sites that do not have strong BRDFs. And you've heard me talk about the last day and a half about how my sites have no strong BRDF. So I should be able to do a calibration between them and get perfect agreement. The bands are the same, they're at the same time. You're probably guessing what's coming because I'm spending a lot of time talking about how it should have been perfect. <laughs> and before we got started, I wanted to make sure that the 3B wasn't going to cause these problems from an atmospheric standpoint. And the way to start with is this master band 3 is this part of the spectrum here at about 800 nanometers. And what I did was I basically ran the radio transfer code. And I ran for some reflectances, two cases, 0.05 and 0.8. So I knew I was spanning the reflectance I would see at my test site. And for each of these, there's a specific you know, color for each one. So I have the yellow and the orange. The uh, orange is down here. That's the uh, 0.8 high reflectance, high aerosol. Um, 0.05 is the low reflectance, high aerosol. What that means is it's a very, instead of a 0.1 optical thickness, it's a 0.3 or 0.4, uh, like the hell up there, about 3x uh, in terms of the aerosols. So basically, uh, the average is 0.05, I have a 0.15 optical thickness. Um, so I have the, the, the low reflectance, the high reflectance, and I have a low aerosol and a high aerosol. Um, and then over here, I have a 0.4 reflectance, and this is basically the same reflectance as what I would have at my test site. And what it tells me is, is that, so here's 0.95, here's 1, 1.05, the effect due to the atmosphere alone. So if the surface is truly land version, I would see for my typical case, just a small little shift in, in the radiance at the sensor, which makes sense. It's the atmosphere, even if I'm assuming a very thick, so very thin, the surface is still a very bright. If I go to the 0.8, that percent difference is even a little bit smaller because the surface is so much brighter. I'm not going to see much of a difference in the fact though because it's a, such a high reflectance, you're really going to see that much of a change because of wavelength and the way I ran the code. I'm not changing the molecular or anything else. Everything stays the same. Uh, in terms of the low reflectance, you see something that's a little more dominant. So if I were going to go over water, I might have to worry about the atmospheric component of this study. But in this case, I should see no difference. The rate of transfer tells me there's no difference. The fact that I'm assuming my inversion tells me there's no difference. The sensors are exactly the same. And when I go ahead and I do the calibration work, the spurs are the band 3M, the 
circles are the 3D, and there's a bit of a separation on some of these particular dates. And when I went and looked, what I found was these dates, where there were large differences, were all at Railroad Valley. So then it was, well, maybe my assumption of Lambertian wasn't quite right. So the rate of transfer theory told me this should not be an issue. I should have gotten really good agreement, really good matchup. But I'm seeing very large differences. And this is in the counts for radiance. In terms of the L1B, I'm seeing it there as well. So this is not because of some processing speed problem. This is a, it's not a degradation as a function of time. This is a real difference between the cause someplace. And it has to be the surface. That's the only logical thing, because we had other methods that showed that the 3D and 3N really nobody had noticed any differences. People have been using the instrument for many years. I just happened to be trying it for the first time when, when I was doing this in the 2005-2006 time frame. At about that time, we had deployed radiometers out at Railroad Valley that basically looked straight down. And if I told you that, you'd go, well, that's not going to help you because looking straight down, you want directional effects. The sun angle moves. And if I have a radiometer that's out there all of the time, and for several months, I can get a large range of azimuths, I get a large range of sun angles, and we process through basically getting rid of all of the rainy days, the days where it's been kind of wet, and the cloudy days, and just grab as much of the day as we could. And pretty much ended up with that top graph there in terms of one of the bands, it's a near infrared band, so the atmosphere is not a big deal, and it's roughly the same band as what the, the 3M is, the 3D is. And basically just assume, because I had a solar zenith angle, this thing that was changing, I said, let's just put it as cosine of solar zenith angle, cosine of the scattering angle, essentially. Because as this changes, I could also view it as doing this, would be the same geometry, but I just have this mounted in one place. And did a regression through that, and got a formulation basically that tells me what the reflectance of the surface is as a function of the incident solar zenith angle. Went and looked at MODIS data. So again, here are my near infrared data, use that as a plot. And then here's what the MODIS retrievable from several days worth of information for railroad valley. And that, that unfortunately to say is that's really good agreement. And it really isn't that different if you stop and start looking at percentage-wise something at the top of the atmosphere at one kilometer scale, averaged over 32 days, is being matched up against something at the bottom of the atmosphere looking at about this much ground and getting an answer like that. But what it gave me was I have confidence in my model. And when we applied that model to the 3D case, so here's the original. And so the circles, again, would be uncorrected. And you can see the impact. In some cases, you still have some differences. So there's a residual ERDF that we probably have to get rid of. But the improvement is pretty good, considering that we basically blindly did this. And what the lesson of this all was for me was I then started talking to some people and just had gotten lazy and hadn't paid enough attention that in the summertime, at Railroad Valley, the sun rises and it moves fast enough in azimuth that by the time the sensor's going over and it's looking in the backward direction, it's near the principal plane of the sun, which means I start to get shadowing effects caused by the small structure of the bumps in the surface. And the person who pointed this out, when I showed this at the astronaut, he goes, oh yeah, you just see what we see on Mars all the time. And I went, oh, and he showed me his Gave you a point, I went and read the paper, and sure enough, it's the fact that you basically have a hot spot effect that's happening. And I had always worried about Lambertianness in the cross track direction because that's where a sensor looks off Nader, it's looking off in the cross track. And everything we were calibrating was doing sun synchronous at about an 89, 93, or whatever inclination, so it was pretty much almost east west. So we start looking cross-track east-west, you do not have a large, the non-lambertian nature of the surface is irrelevant. You start looking backwards towards the principal plane and now it becomes important. 
So the message here, the takeaway is that we can do all of our error budgets, we can do all of our analyses, we can do all our sensitivities, we can run the perfect rate of transfer codes. If we get the physics wrong, we're going to make a mistake. And it takes a lot to own up on something like this. This is kind of embarrassing for me. And I could have not told it, I could have just led with, left all the circles off and said, we went ahead and did a calibration of 3B and here's the answer. But what I was really trying to do is prove to people the importance of this automated measurement system as well. And so that was the nice thing is because we had those automated data, we could validate what the modus retrieval was telling us in terms of BRF, which then allowed us to do a correction. The other way to look at this, and this will come up again later on this afternoon, so I'm going to spend a lot of time on it, but test sites. So I've been talking about Railroad Valley and Ivanpah, and we do calibration. The rate of transfer should be the same. The site size is a little bit different. So maybe there's an effect because of the site size related to what Mark was talking about in terms of adjacency effects at 15 kilometers and 2 kilometers. And when I do the comparison between them, there's a few that you can tell the differences. The size of these blocks is related to the repeatability. It's the standard deviation of that average. None of these are statistically significantly different. They're not exactly the same, but they're not different from a statistical viewpoint. So that tells me that if there's an adjacency effect, it's buried. If there's um, some other issue that's going on, it's buried. And that makes some sense, because even though the two kilometer site should be impacted to some extent by adjacency effects, the combination of the high reflectance of the material of the site itself the relatively high reflectance or similar reflectance of the surrounding material, and the fact that the atmosphere is fairly clear, I should not see that effect. And again, we did studies with rate of transfer to see if that was the case. And that matched what we got in terms of the output. So to drive that a little bit further, when we're looking at this, the idea is that we have some smaller sites too. The question is, is whether or not you see some effects um, for adjacency and whether or not you have some effects that might be caused by size of source. And I'll show this case again, but I want to show it from an adjacency standpoint first and tease you with something later on. So this is Landsat. This is Aster. Landsat does not show an adjacency effect issue. Aster has all sorts of interesting little features and we're trying to figure out what's going on. In this case, I'm just looking in the case of Aster, I'm band four, which is equivalent to 1650 nanometers. And Landsat does not show. In fact, when you think about it, there should be no differences because at the longer wavelengths, there's no attenuation. The air saw the depth is low, the molecular output depth is low. So rate of transfer tells me this should not happen, so there must be something else going on. And I'm going to save the, the punchline on that one until later on this afternoon. Or maybe one maybe tomorrow. Because mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to keep you here till seven o'clock today. Do not have to do it. So not not a problem. But what about smaller sites? We were driving 14 hours to go to all of these sites in Nevada. Seven hours to go to one in, in near Las Vegas, and it's a lot of time. It's a lot of cost. It's boring. As I was getting older, I really didn't want to go 14 hours in the car anymore. My back starts to hurt. Uh, there's all the problems there. So we try to find something near Tucson. And I'll talk some more about this tomorrow. We'll talk about the test site searches and we kind of the prelude to what Sydney's talking about. And we did an automated search and we found nothing, but then we went ahead and picked something. So that'll, I'll talk more about tomorrow. But we found something that was about five by five Landsat pixels. So 150 meters by 150 meters. That's not a very big area. And it is surrounded by stuff that isn't the same. And you've seen the imagery a couple of times already. Um, University of Arizona, that's where I was working. We would take a freeway all the way out there. It was never as crowded as the freeways out here in Washington, D.C. So it usually did not take very long, um, about 25, 30 minutes to get out to this area here. And there's a racetrack, which is the oval. And then there's a racetrack here which is uh, this one right here, which is the drag strip, where the cars go very fast in a straight line. And we were using the parking lots. 
because it was several Landsat pixels. We were being funded through Landsat calibration. So the idea was we would do all the Landsat calibrations every 16 days at this test site. But everyone kept saying, well, you know, it's a small site, and you know, the reflectance isn't so good. You know, really you're down here in terms of the reflectance. Instead of having this really bright reflectance at White Sands or this really kind of nice, but look at how flat that structural reflectance is. So it's really nice and flat. Its standard deviation in percent is high because the reflectance is low. But it's still reasonably uniform. And more importantly, it's, it's flat, it's hard, it's easy to characterize. You can, in 150 meters, we can walk like this. And still not take as much time as trying to cover 30 by, or 80 by 300 meters. So we could make sure we were really doing a good job in terms of understanding what's happening at that site. And the reason this discussion is in the range of transfer part, you know, it seems to be kind of going all over the place on these topics. And part of it is, well, I just happen to have something to toss into this part of the lecture. But the other is, is there's this thing I call the magic reflectance. And this is why I led off the whole discussion with that plot of the surface reflected, the direct solar coming down and hitting the ground and going up in the path radiance turn. So I have a top of atmosphere radiance. And at a high reflectance, basically if I start to increase the amount of optical thickness, I get a small change in the top of atmosphere radiance. And again, it's, it's you see, and it's mostly because you're getting a trade-off in terms of as I start to increase the optical thickness at a high reflectance, I'm getting rid of that direct solar turn. And I'm increasing the path radiance, and I'm not going to increase the path radiance relative to the direct solar in the right way. I'll start to see changes. At the lower reflectance, as I increase the optical thickness, I'm basically going to change again the, the combination between the direct solar hitting the ground and bouncing off and getting through the atmosphere versus the path radiance turn. The path radiance turn is, is fairly a high contributor here, but I'm going to be increasing the down line skylight and I'm going to get that reflected back up and I'm going to get an increase a change in, in, the, in the top of the radiance. And this particular reflectance, in this case, the point three reflectance, I basically have a situation where every time I do something to the path radiance, I do exactly the opposite to the direct solar turn. And they always balance. As I change the amount of stuff in the atmosphere, they balance. Now, if I change and I change the yoga parameter, it's not this easy. This will shift around. So that magic number may not be 0.3, it might be closer to 0.2 or 0.25. And in Tucson, for our typical aerosol conditions, it was closer down to this 0 0.25, 0 0.2. So using the, the racetrack in the parking lot where the reflectance is around 0 0.25, 0 0.3, actually means I, I shouldn't have to make any measurements of the atmosphere at all. I just have to get one calculation right, and I can just measure the reflectance, and I'm done. I can pretty much just go ahead and do the TOA radiance that way. You still want to do it, but the nice thing is, is it means that my uncertainty caused by the atmosphere is negligible. You want to really bother a group of scientists. Go to a meeting where there are applications people who work over vegetation <laughs> and start talking about this and then, oh, you're wrong. You're wrong. And I'll go, but it's a model. Well, no, the models never tell you what really happens. Well, no, I'm, I'm telling the model what I want it to be, and the model is telling you this is what happens. It might be sort of different in real life, but it's not going to be that different. It might be that different. And that's still only you know, a few tenths of a percent. So this is a really good site. You guys got to believe us. Oh, but you have adjacency effect problems. Well, so we started to go ahead and collect data. We got results. Um, the average here, these are now instead of having, this is over um, basically three years worth of, or four years worth of time. And you can see where, you know, in certain cases, there were students who were collecting out of the test site. And early on, we had a lot. And so we missed a few because of bad weather. So over a 12-month time period, we have 26 overpasses. 
we only really got what we consider to be five good data points. Um, that's just was bad luck because of, of timing with rain clouds in the summertime and uh, it was an El Nino, I think, and so we had a lot of cloudy conditions that winter. It's just the way things go and no sensing. But we were able to then do a calculation of what the gain was in terms of measured versus pre-flight, and we do the same thing with our big site. But we were able to get standard deviations and calibration coefficients. And we can compare it to what would happen if you ended up driving all of that distance. And the odd thing is we have more of the large site work because we were basically told by NASA, don't bother wasting your time. We want you to do the big site. That's what we paid you to do. Go use the big site. And the students, there wasn't a lot of time for them to go out to the site during the semesters and everything else. And so you know, we were limited to what we had, but everything seemed very encouraging in terms of of agreeing with each other. And when you do it in terms of a small site, large site, it's reasonably good agreement. There's not much of a difference in standard deviation. There are in a couple of cases. Um, and the statistical significance is in panels two, three, and four. And so immediately everybody jumped on it. They said, oh, you have an adjacency effect. You have an adjacency effect. And I kept going, well, you know, maybe there might be something up with Landsat. Maybe we have an out-of-field response or something. We don't quite understand the sensor. No, no, no. And you do know you guys have a scanner, and we're scanning across this small surface. And so optically, you know, I really don't think we ought to be looking at that instead of, you know, adjacency effect. No, no, you have an adjacency effect. So as in all good sciences, you run away and you basically take a break and go chase the ice cream truck. Mm -hmm. And you'll have to wait to find out the outcome of that later this afternoon. 